chapter 9. I'd like to just read some scriptures and I'd just share a, I mean for me a slightly different kind of message, but from in these scriptures is my, my starting point. Reading from Matthew chapter 9, reading verses 16 and 17. These are Jesus' words. He said, No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch will pull away from the garment, making the tear worse. Neither do men pour new wine into old wineskins. If they do, the skins will burst. The wine will run out, and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins, and both are preserved. And Jesus says, using two different pictures to illustrate an amazing truth. In his first picture, he, from the first verse that we read, no one sews a hatch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. And he's saying that um, in their day, certainly the uh, material they used was material that with a great deal of washing would shrink. He's saying that if you had a, had a garment and, and it, it had a section that it had worn through, you were going to put a patch on it, you be very, very careful because you make sure that both the patch and the garment that is going on had both been through a shrinkage process. Said so if you don't do that, you'll find that the patch will go on. You'll find that one of the garment, either the garment or the patch, one of them will, will, will shrink. You'll find that the patch that's gone on will then pull away. Then the second picture that he gives Neither do men pour new wine into our wineskins. They do, the skins will burst, wine will run out, and the wineskins will be ruined. And in their day, it was pretty common for wine to be kept in the skins of animals that had been sewn up. But what would happen is that when the uh, grape juice, when it first went into those skins, and it was kept there for a period of time, the grape juice would begin to ferment. As it fermented, it would release gases, and as it released the gases, it would expand. And if they were using an old wineskin, an old wineskin that had become hardened over a long period of time, with the expansion of the gases, and the wineskin would no longer have gear in it, and so it would begin to rip and begin to tear, and that whatever was inside it, whatever the wine was inside it, would begin to leak through the, through the tears. So, with these two pictures, what is Jesus talking about? He's talking about certainly the old and the new. He's saying that there are old things and new things, some of which cannot go together. And I want to put it into context, and I want to read the uh, verses just prior to it. Verses 14 and 15, it says, Then John's disciples came and asked him, how is it that we and the Pharisees fast, but the disciples do not fast? Jesus answered, How can the guests of the bridegroom mourn while he is with them? Time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. Then they will fast. And I just want to put this into a little bit of context. Because Jesus is saying here that John the Baptist and his message were part of an earlier thing that God had been doing, an earlier era, an earlier season, an earlier dispensation. But that with the coming of the Lord Jesus, there was a new era, a new season that was beginning, a new dispensation. We would know it as a new covenant that was going to be brought into play through the Lord Jesus and through His dying for us. So he's actually looking at John the Baptist and John the Baptist's followers and the message that John the Baptist had. And he's saying this actually represents the old. That comes as a surprise to a lot of people who uh, tend, as we, tend to, as we read the scripture through, we tend to think of John the Baptist as being more on that part with the Lord Jesus. Let me just read to you a couple of chapters up further up from Matthew chapter 11 and verse 11. Jesus said this, I tell you the truth, among those born of women, there was not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Because from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing. Forceful men are laying hold of it. For all the prophets and the law 
prophesy until John. So the Lord Jesus is saying that John was the final prophet of a dispensation, of an era, of a season. That season began way, way back, 1,500 years earlier with Moses. That season had gone right through with the coming of the Lord and the prophets, who were the, uh, in a sense, the police of the Lord, who were bringing God's people back to the, to the covenant of the Lord. But Jesus was saying that this man, John the Baptist, he was the last prophet of that era. So when God caused this man to come forth, he would be the last prophet. He would be the last one of an era that had lasted some 1,500 years. But there's something different was happening in the Lord Jesus. Even though he was the one, John the Baptist was the one, the final prophet, he would get to see Israel's Messiah, the Lord Saviour. He would get to announce him. But he would still be the last and the final prophet of the earlier era. Seasons. Seasons. I was meant to show this slide slightly earlier. Seasons. God gives us natural seasons and he gives us spiritual seasons. How many weeks into the last month of August are we? The last month of winter. Last month of August. Winter. How many weeks in are we? One week. Does it feel like we're in the middle of winter? This Thursday, what's the maximum going to be? 28. Does that feel like the middle of winter? No. Oh, for those who, uh, well, never mind, I won't say that. <laughs> so we, we might be only one week into August, a winter month, but there are signs of spring, aren't there? Mm -hmm. When you look around, I have this um, weird thing. I am not a gardener, as probably some of you know, but we have an amazing garden. And I love it when uh, people come and they compliment both of us on our, on our garden. <laughs> I just smile. <laughs> and last time someone said that, I just nudged Teresa because um, I, I thought uh, I'd better give a nudge to the one who's done all the work. But you know, every single day, I go out into one section, or there are two sections um, of, our, of our garden that I look, look at. And I, I look, because we, we've got all this mulch that's uh, gone, gone down to try to preserve whatever uh, moisture is in that um, soil, particularly because we're expecting a very, very warm summer. And I look for the tiniest little green leaf, tiny little green leaf. And you know, every single day I see a new little green leaf forming. Those green leaves are part of a, a plant that I'm looking for called valeria. It's a uh, kind of a mauve plant that in time will look like, like this. Right, right now, it's just just little tiny little leaf just, just looking through. But valerian grows extremely quickly. Within a couple of days, uh, that will be, a, 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 that'll be probably four or five centimetres tall. And, and it's because within the soil, the seed is feeling the warmth because there's a change of season. We have another plant that I really like called Cor Coriopsis. I love to pronounce them because it makes people think I know a real lot about this stuff. But Coriopsis, through the um, winter season, it, it, it just, it's just a, a straggly, sort of low-level green plant. And um, uh, often the external leaves can, can die back and be brown and really, really looks awful. But when the plant begins to sense a change in the temperature, the leaves begin to thicken. And you, you go from having this plant that may have five or six straggly leaves, suddenly there are dozens of these tiny little leaves all forming within the same plant. Then the leaves begin to change shape. And then uh, you see the stem coming up, and we don't have pictures of it, but, but then you have these amazing yellow flowers that, that come up. But there's a change in the season. And that's what I want you to see. Like It's kind of not like um, winter waits till August 31st. Yeah. Just got half my glasses in my right eye there. Winter doesn't wait till August 31st and say, all right, that's it, we're gone now. And then the next day, suddenly spring. There are changes. There are changes that take place little bit by little bit by little bit. I've lost some notes somewhere. Here they are. Hurry. So the season might be still winter. 
But the changes are beginning to take, take place. And the season is changing. The season is changing not only in the natural, but there's a spiritual change in the season, even within our, our own city, even within our own church. And sometimes pr prophetic people, I think when uh, Fanny Sparks, how many years back did she share the message on the tipping point? Two to three years back. Because she was sensing something that was coming. And even though she spoke of it as if it was right at the very door, and from a prophetic point of view, it was right at the very door. But from our point of view, it was still a couple of years away. But she saw it through that prophetic mantle of something that was right there before us. And I want to put to you that in a very same kind of way, God is announcing a new season. God is announcing a new season. Now, I find it interesting that when I look at the at the message that the Lord Jesus brought. And when I look at those who were most resistant to that, to that message, there were, there were two groups. I'm going to say most resistant. There were uh, putting uh, perhaps the Pharisees or Sadducees together in uh, one group and then a second group that I'm going to uh, talk about in a moment. So the, the, the first group, there were those who, who rejected the message were the religious leaders of Jesus' day. The Sadducees and the Pharisees. Now they rejected the message principally because Jesus claimed God's authority for what he did and what he said. The Sadducees, who were the priestly, uh, the priestly class, they believed that God's authority was vested in the temple in Jerusalem. And because Jesus was saying that God's authority was vested in him, they thought he was taking authority away from the, from the temple. The Pharisees, of course, believed that the, uh, the authority of God was vested in what we call the Old Testament. But the Lord Jesus was saying that he was speaking words that the Father was giving him. So they felt he was taking authority away from, from what they understood, uh, what we understood, I should say, as the Old Testament. And so they rejected him and they rejected his message. Uh, in Jesus ministry and by the end of his ministry we know that they finished up even saying that the miracles that he was performing were being performed by the devil. So they had turned right around and they were now claiming that this one who was the eternal son of God who was only speaking the words that the father gave him, who was only doing the works that he saw the father doing. And they finished up saying that his words were the words of the devil and his works were the works of the devil. Even the miracles were performed from the devil. Now I want to put to you that I believe in my own heart that in this city, that the Spirit of God is going to move in a most extraordinary way. We're going to see in this city uh, tens of thousands of people went to Christ. And we're going to see amazing, amazing miracles. And I can't help but feel that, that many who are uh, within established churches are going to be strongly rejecting of the great work that God does. And I think that in the same way that when the Lord Jesus came, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious leaders, were rejecting. And I can't help but feel that we will see something very, very similar in our own city. God is going to move. God is going to move. Many are going to question whether this is really God. Now the second group, this may surprise some of you who know the Old Testament, know the New Testament well enough. John the Baptist and his followers, now they didn't reject Jesus as the Messiah, but they wondered, they questioned, is he really the Messiah? Because John the Baptist, he had a certain personality. And, uh, uh, sometimes when we used to talk about the motivational gifts, we used to talk about the prophetic personality. And this is someone who sees everything black and white. And so uh, John the Baptist, he would have no trouble if he saw King Herod had taken his brother's wife wrongly. We know historically in their own day that Herodias, who had been the wife of his brother Philip, she had actually divorced her husband that in their day was just unknown. It was unknown, hard enough for a Jewish leader to divorce their partner, but for a wife to divorce the husband was unknown. But Herodias divorces her husband and then she marries King Herod. And so John the Baptist comes in and says, you can't be the king of the Jews. You can't be the leader of the Jewish nation if you're going to do that. 
Now, he would have expected the Messiah to be like him. He would have expected the Messiah to have this black and white prophetic personality that he would, he would name and shame and, and, and if he saw something wrong, he would put it right instantly. And so when Jesus comes, not only to... See, John the Baptist is all for truth and Jesus is for truth, but tempered by mercy. And so when, when the Lord Jesus in Matthew 11, he says, go to John's disciples and tell him about the blind seeing, and he goes through all these things that show the mercy of God. So in Christ, there was not only the truth that was so, so particular within John the Baptist, but there was truth and there was mercy. And so it caused, uh, John the Baptist, it caused his followers to really question, is this really the Messiah? Is it really the Messiah? I can't help but feel that as the Spirit of God moves, we will see a lot of people who have known the touch of God, who will even wonder, the touch of God either in their personal history or in their denom denominational history. They would truly wonder, can this really be God? And unfortunately, too often in church history, the greatest critics of a new move of God have been those who were part of the preceding move of God. And we know that when Martin Luther in the early 1500s was the one who stood very, very strongly and then began what we now know as Lutheranism, those who most fiercely rejected him were the Catholic Church. And then we know that as God moved and began to unveil further truth and, and the truth of uh, water baptism and the truth that the person that you were when you came to Christ, that person died. Person we being in Christ in his death and resurrection. And a, a group were raised up called the Anabaptists. Do you know the most fearsome persecutors of the Anabaptists were the Lutherans? <coughs> Lutherans. There are terrible stories of Anabaptists being drowned by being held underwater by, by, by people who had followed the Lutheran faith. Then, uh, as God moved and another great leader raised up, John Wesley, and the various holiness churches. But do you know those who were among the fiercest critics of the holiness churches were the Anabaptists. They were the ones who had been in the preceding move of God. And then at the turn of the last century, when the holiness churches are what they feel standing for the truth of God. God begins to move in Los Angeles in a little, a, a little building in uh, Azusa Street. And the Spirit of God is poured out. And the Pentecostal church is birthed. And do you know amongst their greatest critics were the holiness churches. Because they felt that God had moved through them. God had done wonderful things through them. And so often the one who is the fiercest critic. Of the, of the present move of God is the one who is the recipient of the preceding move of God. So we have to have a heart that, that is looking for a fresh touch of God over us. Not to be people who say, I remember the old days. Weren't they wonderful? They were wonderful, but they were the old days. And I'm not trying to take away from that because I just want you to, to, to see something here too. I trust it's the next slide, I think it is. Yeah. With each new move of God, God builds on what happened in the preceding move. He doesn't discard it. So even with the great Pentecostal outpouring, God said, hey, holiness doesn't matter. And then with the holiness churches being raised up, He didn't say, water baptism doesn't matter. And then when the, and so it went back and back and back and back. He built on the truth He had given the body of Christ. And so we have to be a people who we build on the great truths that the Spirit of God has reinforced at different times within church history. We have to be careful that those who may represent a, a, a movement or a denomination or a group that we're not rejecting of them or rejecting of their truth rather because they may be rejecting of us and of what we feel God is saying in our day. We have to have a heart that says God is not discarding the truth that, that that group or that denomination represents. But he's building on it. He hasn't finished with that. And so as we, we're looking to God for what God wants to do, we have to be always building. Always building on the prior truth. I believe we're at the beginning of a change of season. The, the seasons change slowly, but they do change. 
Now what happens is this, that, that, that when perhaps we're in a meeting and God begins to do something new, something different, we begin to sense God moving in a new way in our heart and in our life. You may go to a meeting somewhere and, and get a great touch of God. And then, and then sometimes people find that they, 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 it's like God's done something new inside them, like there's new wine, and it's, and it's beginning to give them a new wine skin. And, and He's given them a new wine skin, and they try to fit in, and they try to push it back into, into the pattern of the way things work. And it simply doesn't work like this. Oh. It's, my slide's gone. All right, I had a brilliant slide that somehow disappeared. I have no idea why. All right, so in this slide, which has nothing there when I describe it, <laughs> but it shows an onion, and a section of the onion has been cut out, and a piece of mandarin has been pushed into that section where the piece of the onion has been cut out, and it fits perfectly. But how many know an onion and mandarin are not the same? And see, it's like, like a mandarin is sweet. Onions are not sweet. You give a, a young child a bit of an onion to chew on. What kind of look do they give you? Oh, oh. But give them a mandarin and there's sweetness to it. And like, and like as God begins to touch our heart, like he gives us a new wineskin, it's like he, he gives us something of the mandarin sweetness. And then we, we can't go back. We can't just push that into the groove of the onion. It simply doesn't work. The Spirit of God has touched it. The Spirit of God is beginning to change our wineskin. So I, I, I guess I, I just want you this morning to, to have a heart that is beginning to stir. I want you like the, the little seeds that morning by morning, and I went out this morning, it was a bit cold too, and went out this morning and I, and I found two more little tiny green leaves. Tiny, tiny, tiny green leaves. Now, now as they, they get bigger, I'm really hoping that they turned out to be clover or something like that, but, but, but they're tiny little green leaves, but they will grow quickly. And it tells me there is a change happening. And I guess I, I just had on my heart this morning Go back and perhaps I'll bring it to a close with uh, Jesus same words. Where it said, No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. But the patch will pull away from the garment, making the tear worse. Neither do people pour new wine into old wine skins. If they do, the skins will burst. The wine will run out. Wine skin will be ruined. They pour new wine into new wine skins. Both are preserved. So my heart is that we as a church will be a new wineskin. And as I said, the season is only just beginning to change. Not like we're, we're seeing just instantly enormous, dramatic, completely different things. But there's something new happening. There's a, a stirring, there's, like there's a, a breeze that different ones are beginning to hear, beginning to feel. I just want you to have a heart that says, God, I don't want to be left behind. I don't want to be like John the Baptist who, uh, with a certain way of thinking that when the new era comes and the new era came in Christ, that I would be those, amongst those who simply hold on to what we've had before. I would love to say I can see exactly what the new is going to look like. I can't. I just know it's going to be a lot prettier than the old. Amen. And I know it's going to be a lot more satisfying than the old. And I know there's something within me that, that is beginning to just cry out and say, God, 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 I, I, don't, I don't want to just go back to what we had. I don't want to take away from it because that was really wonderful. But I'm saying, God, there's something new happening. Amen. There's, a, there's a, a call or a cry in my own heart. And I guess it becomes a cry for revival. The thing that I, I, I have a perhaps reticent about the word revival is that we use it for, or I've heard it used for a series of exciting meetings. Revival to me is when a community is touched. Revival is when the Spirit of God doesn't just move over the Christians, but it begins to move over the non-Christians. 
begin to, to put something within the hearts of non-Christian, they begin to reach out and they begin to wonder whether maybe there is something to this God thing. And, and perhaps through circumstances, they even go to other Christians, begin to ask for them. So like, like if this church were to see explosive growth, but we did not impact our city, one iota, that would not be revival to me. Revival would be when the city begins to feel the impact of the Spirit of God. It begins to, to, to feel a conviction over their own hearts. I remember reading just recently about a city in America that's meant to have uh, amongst the largest churches in that city. But they say that as their churches have grown, so has the crime rate. And to me, it's like, like they're building the churches, but the kingdom, and they're building the kingdom into the, into the hearts of those who are in those churches, but it's not impacting the city. I want to see Ipswich for Christ. Amen. I want to see the fire of God touch our city in a very special way. And then look, whether, you know, whether the uh, individual churches are, are, are growing massively or not, it's what's happening in this city. And I remember a couple of weeks back, and uh, I often I pray much through the night, because I reckon if I'm awake, I might as well make it count. I think if the devil woke me up, I'll give him curry. And if God woke me up, I'll make it count. So remember, I, I'm praying, and I, I just, I kind of, you know how you think you're wide awake? Then you find yourself praying something stupid and you think, I'm not as awake as I thought I was. So I will often roll over to wake up a bit more so I can pray a little bit more clearly, which is a bit silly because Teresa said when I do that, I sometimes kick her. Like the, <laughs> I'm just trying to wake up so I can pray better, so I'm just blaming God for kicking my, my wife, all right? <laughs> but you know, in the, in the midst of it, about, um, just a little while back, I, I found this, this thought or these words for me in my head, pray. Pray, pray, pray that God will bring in a harvest in this city that befits the price he paid for. Yes. And I, I, I have prayed that. I've prayed it even in the last 10, 10 days, 2 weeks. I've literally prayed it hundreds of times. And there's a cry within my heart that God says, God, I want to see a harvest in the city. But I want to see a harvest that befits the incredible cost to you. Because... I know there's a chorus we used to sing, I'll never know how much it cost to see my sin upon the cross. I know I've often, often when I think about that, and, and I guess I've just been around long enough, long in the tooth where I've still got some, um, to just know, to know, to have a sense of what it cost Christ to go to the cross. What it cost Him to bear the sin of humanity. And so I, I just something deep within just begins to rise to God in the early hours just morning by morning saying God give us a harvest that befits the cost that befits the price that you paid for it. and, and it, I, I, I just like I said it's just a, a, there's a change there's something happening not that we're seeing it here in, in, a, in an enormous way but the city is going to be moved the city is going to be touched I just want us to be a new wineskin. I don't want us to be an old wineskin that just longs for the old days. So when the new wine is poured in, we have no gear. We're, we're old and we're, we're, we're hardened. And because we're hardened, the new wine did expand and the wineskin breaks. want us to be a new wineskin. Do you want to be a new wineskin? Amen. Do you want to hold the new wine? Do you want to be one who'd be a receptacle for the Spirit of God to move and touch and do something greater through Praise the Lord. Can we, can we stand together? Musicians, can you come? I'm going to sing a um, song. Father, I just bless you that new wine is coming. New wine is coming. Father, I look to you that, that as much as you've done, we love what you've done. Father, the old wineskin will not carry the new wine. We just pray by your Spirit. You would give us new wineskins. God, that as the wine pours in and the wine ferments and the, the, the wine expands and the gases are released, God, that we'll have a wineskin that can carry the new work that you're doing in this day. Yes. Father, I pray, give us a heart. Give us a heart that longs for more than we've seen. Stir up our hearts, oh God. 
Father, for those who, who are having great difficulty reading the Bible, cause there to be a new hunger. Those who have difficulty praying, a new hunger, Lord God. Those who have not been showing the love of God to those around them. A new desire and a breaking of the old. Releasing into the new. Pray that you'll do that, Lord God. I just, I just thank you, Lord God. There is the sound. There is the sound of revival. God is going to come to the city. Not going to be one church here and one church there. It's going to come to the city. And many, 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 many churches and countless brand new churches are going to open up all over the city to contain the great move of God. Hallelujah. So Father, give us wineskins that are prepared. Give us individual wineskins. Let this church be a new wineskin. Not holding on to what's been God with a heart for something new. God's people said, Amen. 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 We're going to sing our final chorus.